likes, like hey Scoob, did you hear Nikki Blake is hosting a Scooby-Doo panel? No. Yeah. Like on today's Scooby-Doo episode, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy meet Nikki Blake. Yeah, in a Scooby panel. <laughs> Like we need to get this puppy started. <laughs> okay, Nikki Blake, take it away, Scooby Doo. <laughs> On today's episode of the Scooby Panel, Nikki and Wendy meet Oscar-winning sound designer Mark Mangini. What age did you become interested in music, and when did you start playing the the guitar? I can really remember it like it was yesterday. My family grew up watching the Ed Sullivan Show every Sunday evening, and the Beatles showed up in 1964. I'm eight years old, and I was smitten. I just and I said to my mom, "I want to buy a guitar," and she bought um, a six-string acoustic guitar from the Sears and Roebuck catalog, <laughs> and put me in guitar lessons in our little town, and that was the beginning of the end. I, it was a it was a love affair from the very beginning. Now. Arguably, my motives were not as pure as one might imagine. Maybe at eight years old, I wanted to be famous through guitar like the Beatles. Mm -hmm. But um, I could easily put that to rest because I love music. I love writing. I love playing. I have guitars everywhere. There's guitars in every room of my home. There's guitars in all of my sound design studios. And this is often how I find relaxation and joy, just the simple act of doing it on my own. Yeah, and, and that's important, especially with how the world is, to be able to find something that brings you joy, that you can relax and... Yeah, that's, that's great. There, I think there's a biological effect, um, especially with an acoustic guitar, because the, the back of the guitar usually rests against your chest or your abdomen, and you feel the vibration. And I know there's some kind of palliative effect going on there that just the vibrations travel through your body and there's maybe there's some healing effect, who knows, but it's all, yeah. it makes me feel good. They, they say that music is healing. I know mm. depending on my mood will depend on what I'm gonna listen to and it can really help me to get out of a bad mood or mm. sometimes put me in one. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the music, I suppose. <laughs> Who are your musical influences? Well, pathetically, mostly guitarists. I mean, especially because I'm a hippie and I grew up in the 60s. It's Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton and... Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan and B.B. King. Those are my really significant influences because I wanted to play in bands. I wanted to play lead guitar and be a front man and, you know, take 16 bar solos. Uh, that was a real goal. And that visceral feeling of being on stage with your guitar cranked up and the distortion turned way up just felt good. Um, but now uh, I listen to a very, very eclectic mix of everything, not just music, but spoken word. And I mean, you know, I, I, I can remember as, as a young man, I thought it was important to define myself by the music that I listened to or didn't listen to. And that was one way of for us as young individuals to kind of mark our territory and define ourselves to others. I don't listen to that, or I don't listen to that. And um, that was never true in my case. I, I love all music, um, atonal music. I love John Cage. I love, I love found sound. Um, I love musique concrète. I love classical music. I love Hungarian choirs. Um, I love it all because in my world, even though I'm a sound designer, um, uh, 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 that's what I do for, for a living. T everything I hear is music. I, I hear, to me, I don't differentiate between listening to a Bach fugue and downtown LA traffic because I see a connectivity of timbre and rhythm and, and tone and pitch and frequency and intensity. 
And I'm, my brain, unfortunately, I can't turn it off. I'm constantly analyzing the, the sonic uh, universe that I'm surrounded by. And it's a real curse because I, it's hard to go to a movie without thinking about the sound instead of paying attention to the story and the words and the plot. That's really hard. And, and I do that every, even my wife chides me when we go on vacation. I'm always listening and I always bring a sound recorder and I'm always capturing the universe that surrounds me even when we're supposed to be taking time off. It's, it's part of you, so, you know, it's something <laughs> that you enjoy and it's, it's great. I don't know if your wife agrees, but <laughs> <laughs> at the age of 19, you started working in the sound department at Hanna-Barbera making funny noises for cartoons, such as the Scooby-Doo Dynama Hour, Super yeah. Friends, Scooby yeah. Goes Hollywood, yeah. the Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo Show, and yeah. many others. Yeah. How did you get that job and what was it like working there? Boy, a great question. That was a just a joyful job. Um, I got the job because I drove from Boston to Los Angeles intent on doing something in media. Um, I, and I, all I knew was that I loved movies, and that drew me to Los Angeles. Los Angeles, arguably, is the capital of movie making in the United States. And so I thought, I'm just going to go. I had no connections. I had no prospects. I simply had youthful desire and, and energy. And I would end up staying in the guest house of a friend of my dad's, uh, who I never saw. And I tried, I got some jobs at some local guitar shops just to keep me alive. But, and I wasn't actually actively pursuing studios to find work until one day I bumped into um, the gentleman whose guest house I was living in. And he asked me how the job hunting was going. And I said, well, pretty bad. Nothing's really going on. I might take a job at Taco Bell. And he said, what do you like to do? And I, I said, well, you know, um, growing up, my dad had given me his 8 millimeter movie camera. And this is film. This is a long time ago. This is four, 50 years ago. And I said, I used to make stop motion animation. Which I did, and I still have those movies of moving little clay figures around and, you know, my, my, my friends doing silly things, uh, driving up and down our street. And a day or two later, he gave me a phone number and said, why don't you go meet this gentleman? And it would be Art Scott, who was the VP of Hanna-Barbera at that time in 1976. And I went on an interview, and um, Art told me to bring my portfolio, of course, thinking, I think I had been represented as an artist, uh, an animator, or, or maybe a background painter. And uh, I panicked, but I knew I couldn't, I, I didn't want to blow the interview. So I went to the interview, and I fumfered, oh, Art, I'm really sorry, you know, I'm not an animator, I don't do any of this, I'm just a friend of Mark's, and I, I just want some work, please. And and he was lovely, and he said, well, we don't really have any work for you. I just wanted to meet you, but the fall season, which is you know in September back then, that's when the new cartoons came out, um, we have a big order from the networks, and we're probably going to hire in various departments. I'll let you know. And as fate would have it, sound, the sound department at Hanna-Barbera needed five track readers. And um, allow me briefly to explain what a track reader does. As many know or don't know, the voices have to be recorded first. Otherwise, the animators don't know how to draw the mouths opening and closing. So the track reading department was a branch of the sound department where the recordings would come down from the studio uh, and we would transcribe every consonant and vowel and plosive and fricative onto an exposure sheet that listed every frame of the cartoon, and we would show where the mouth would open and close and how it opened and closed. Is it an O mouth, an E mouth, an M mouth, an L mouth? And that gave the animators a chart on how to accurately open and close the mouths for lip sync. So they got a big order of, of, of cartoons that season, five and a half hours, in fact, which was a big order. They hired five people, and they taught me how to track read and then the rest is kind of history. You'll, you'll let me know if you want to follow how I filed, turned that into, I don't know, sound editing or sound design and how do I get to Dune, you know, so. 
<laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. It was a godsend. And, and I didn't answer your final question. Um, it was a joy. Uh, it was the first time that I had really meaningful work. Bef- I, had, I had left home at 18 years old, and I had only had part-time jobs in like Beth, Bed Bath & Beyond and you know things like that. And this was like a profession, and I felt like I was learning something. And I also knew that I was bringing my musical skills to the job and excelling at it because I had a really refined ear. I, I heard pitch and rhythm, and that's really important in animation. And it was a joyful job because here I was working on something I was just watching five, I mean, I was 18, I don't know, five. When do you stop watching cartoons? When you're 10, 11? Never. <laughs> never. Never. Oh, Even right never answer. Stopped. I mean. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so it was a joy. What a treat. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, we clearly have a love for Scooby, if that wasn't <laughs> obvious. And... <laughs> So thank you for your contribution to to Scooby because if if we didn't have the people like you working on him early on and keeping that alive, we wouldn't be talking about him <laughs> 50 plus years later and we wouldn't have what brings us joy because Scooby <laughs> absolutely, especially for Nikki and I, Scooby makes us happy. Scooby wow. is our safe place Amazing. when we need a little bit of a break from the world. Put yes. on an episode of Scooby-Doo and, and it'll be fantastic. So thank you from the bottom uh, of our hearts for what you worked on with Scooby and everything else that, I mean, everything you do brings people joy. <laughs> not just just doing my job, like ma'am. Everything. <laughs> everything. Um, we did a panel last year looking at the music of Scooby-Doo, the first, the first series. And mm-hmm. for that, in preparation... Uh, Nikki sent around like the isolated musical scores and the tracks and Uh, all of these cues and listening to those without Uh, any visual. Yeah, we didn't need the visual, but it it gave us such a new appreciation and understanding for just how important the sound aspect to anything that you're watching Mm. is. And I feel like Mm. that's something that we're not inherently aware of all of the time. I think maybe we take it for granted, but exactly. getting to listen to those was yeah. Yeah. amazing, honestly, yeah. hearing them like that. So number one, of course, were you a Scooby fan when you started working there? Are you a Scooby fan now? And do you remember any Scooby specific stories or memories even just from your time there would be okay if there's nothing specifically Scooby, sure. but we would love to hear anything. You know, um, Scooby was a little outside of my um, tastes. I I can remember even as a kid, even before I arrived at Hanna-Barbera, feeling like it was just not... I was never a murder mystery... Not murder, never much of a mystery fan. Um, So that didn't pull me in. I I was an out-and-out Flintstones fan, and I did get to work on the Flintstones cartoons, as well as the two subsequent Flintstones feature films in the last couple of decades. Um, So I wasn't particularly a fan, um, which is odd. Well, when I think back, my boss, it was was kind of an assembly line. Unlike today, where in feature films, I'm given months and months to think about and contemplate sound and design sound, that was more of a factory. You, a reel came in from animation, usually Korea at that time, and it was like thrown over the transom, and you had a couple of days to edit sound for a 22, 23, depending on the network, minute episode. That's a lot of sound because animation is unique in that the only sound that exists is the voices. In you know movies, you know they put out a boom pole and you capture all the cars and the sounds on the set. But in animation, you have to fabricate everything and 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 bring it to life so it feels real. So it was a real lot of work, and you often felt lucky if you could simply generate enough sound for the things you were seeing on screen from a pre-existing library. But that uh, precluded any kind of 
custom recordings or anything like that. You, I remember feeling grateful when I had enough time to experiment with one sound. There was a, a new alien in an episode or a spaceship or something science fiction-y that maybe we didn't have a sound for in the library because we had sounds for everything. You know, we had silly sounds for hitting somebody on the head and we had Fred Flintstone's car driving by. But if it was something we had never seen before, I got a chance to manipulate sound and do things to it and design it. But I was lucky if that was one sound. But I do remember feeling very grateful um, for having met Hoyt Curtin and Paul DeCourt. Um, Hoyt and Paul were across the hallway. They were the music department and they worked in two separate music uh, writing studios and and I could they, they always open door and I would just walk in because I just wanted to meet the man that wrote Flintstones meet the Flintstones they're a family family you know, I wanted to meet that man and he's just a lovely gentleman and I had questions about music and how he wrote music for animation and he would be an early seminal influence because in 1976, I, did, I didn't even know what a synthesizer was. And he introduced me to these interesting electronic devices that you could create sounds with. You know, we knew what violins and oboes and clarinets sounded like, but um, synthesizers opened up this whole universe, not only for musicians, but for sound editors and designers like myself. And I became obsessed and fascinated, and, and I, I owe him a great debt of gratitude for that introduction. Um, but, it, you know, it, it all happened so fast. I was at Hanna-Barbera for three and a half years, and in a season I'd do 21, 27, I can't remember what the orders were, episodes in the span of about four months. I might do two or three episodes in a week, and it's all kind of a blur. You know, because much of it is very mechanical. You have the mystery van, and we know what somebody else had already decided. Here's the sound of the mystery van, and here's the sound of when Scooby does a take and shakes his head back and forth. Those are all codified, and you didn't deviate from those prescribed um, <clears throat> uh, 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 sounds. So I remember doing a lot of rote work simply laying in the sounds that were acceptable and feeling good that I had delivered my reel on time to my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I quite honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm really blanking on even a particular episode. Some, something will flash with me in a moment. It, it's funny because my memory of them is much like my impression of them before I started at Hanna-Barbera where it was the five of them standing around talking about something. And that's where it kind of lost me. That, that didn't seem fun to me. Sure. That's fair. We won't judge you too hard for that. <laughs> Please, can I Not stay on hard. for five more minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to give you something good. <laughs> Since you brought up the Flintstones, you did the voice of Dino in the Flintstones on the Rocks. Yeah. Did you ever consider going into acting or voice acting? No, the, uh, you know, it's funny that all happened by accident and as a, um, a, 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 almost a necessity. I became so, in fact, the Dino voice came about out of frustration. I had listened to Dino so many times and I would listen to Mel Blanc. You know, they'd record Mel in the studio and the tapes would come down to me and I'd listen to every utterance. And I, even back then I, I revered Mel Blanc and the skill that he had, but I never thought I had any of those kinds of skills. And so cut to 1980 something and the first uh, Flintstones movie and Brian Levant, the director and I are in the process of interviewing everyone and anyone who does a Dino voice, including Mel's heir, his son. And his son at the time was the go-to for the Dino voice if Hanna-Barbera needed it. They weren't doing much with Dino at the time. And we brought him in. We brought in the greats, uh, you know, like Frank Welker and you name it. It's a long list of, of, of a stellar voiceover recording talent. And after 
many, many weeks, 70 auditions. Uh, at the end of the very last audition, they walk out of the studio and Brian and I turn to each other and it's just, it's not, it doesn't have it. It's not, what is it missing that Mel brought to it? What, what are we missing here? And Brian said, I know what it is. And he walked up to the microphone and he did it. And I said, <laughs> this is just who I am. He sat down, we listened to it. And I said, you know, Brian, it's pretty good, but this is the way Mel used to do it. He inhales instead of exhales. And um, uh, Brian was doing it. And what you have to do is inhale and go. And I'm a little hoarse right now, so I'm not, I'm not doing a good version of it. And Brian said, that's it. You're doing the voice of Dino. So I accidentally backed into a, a, a voiceover career that has since turned into doing the odd voice for every movie that I work on, even in Dune, I have a, a major character that I completely revoiced that the, the filmmaker wasn't, wasn't satisfied with. That's great. <laughs> You've worked as a sound designer, re-recording mixer, supervising sound editor, sound effects editor, ADR editor, loop oh editor, and dialogue editor. For those of us who don't know what each of those entails, could you please explain a little bit about the differences between them? Sure. So, as you can imagine, it might be easier to use an analogy. The supervising sound editor is the individual the director turns to to be responsible for everything you hear in a project other than the music. That's what the composer does. but the supervising sound editor is responsible for, and let's focus on the word responsible because that doesn't mean does it all, but has to be creatively responsible as well as um, physically responsible for some of that work. So my job as a supervising sound editor is to um, uh, ensure that the dialogue, the sound effects, the ambiences, the foley, the sounds you've never heard before are recorded, designed, edited, and mixed so that at the end of all of that work, you have a pleasing soundtrack. So there's this individual at the, 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 the tip of a pyramid, much like perhaps if you think about um, visually in a project, you have the cinematographer. You know, most people, can, are, it's easier to identify there where that's the person responsible for the look of the movie, but the cinematographer doesn't move the camera, doesn't focus the lens, doesn't put up the lights, all the allied elements of the visual look of a project, but that's the person that the responsibility falls to for creating a look. And so to the supervising sound editor and often the sound designer is the person responsible sonically at, at that end of the spectrum. So that puts that person, myself, in charge of a number of individuals that include sound editors, sound designers, ADR editors, and Foley editors. Beginning with sound editors, that was my principal job at Hanna-Barbera. Well, I was a dialogue and sound editor. The sound editor's job is to add in the sounds in its simplest form for the things that are missing. In animation, people are running around and hitting each other on the head and falling down and jumping off of things and all of that needs sound and none of it's in the track. It's the sound editor's job to go record, find and edit those sounds to make sure the sound effects exist. The dialogue editor's job is to ensure that the dialogue, the words we hear, whether in animation or feature films, are clear and articulate and serve the story. And it's a bit of a nuance to someone who doesn't know how a dialogue editor works, but the recordings done in a recording studio at an animation studio are not pure and pristine. You can hear the actor's keys in their pockets and you can hear them shuffling around if they have the wrong kind of clothing on and the microphone picks it up. And it is that dialogue editor's job, among other things, to make sure the track is pristine so that the audience only hears pure and clean dialogue. It also might include um, um, repairing the artist's or actor's diction. So in a recording studio, you look at a line and a character says, uh, keep the chatter down there. And the actor, and maybe even the person recording it, didn't notice because they what they actually said was keep the batter down there. But we need the word chatter. So the dialogue editor will go find that CH sound somewhere else in the recording 
graft it or splice it on the head of batter and now make it chatter. And so the dialogue editor's job is to make sure the dialogue is exactly what the writer intended and in a presented in a fashion that the audience can understand. The Foley editor is also a sound editor, but, but uh, specif um, <clears throat> specifically deals with the um, incidental sounds of movement. We never did Foley on animated films uh, because it was too expensive and we didn't have the time. Foley, literally speaking, is the act of re-recording an actor's movements as they watch them projected on a screen. So if you were to watch Fred walk across the room, you'd need to hear his bare feet on slate. That's not in the recording, so we need that sound. In animation, you, you almost never go to that expense. You fake it with an old canned sound. But in feature films, we hire people who watch the movie projected on a screen in a quiet room and actually walk barefoot on slate. So it's the Foley editor's job to make sure all of those sounds have been um, captured and edited in sync because the performance of that work is, is quite difficult. Even for trained individuals, having your footfall land exactly when Fred's footfall lands. Because if it's not right, if the sync isn't right, there's something off. And it, uh, you know, an audience is usually annoyed subconsciously about it because something doesn't feel right about it. That's a Foley editor. The ADR editor is also a dialogue editor, but a very specific part of dialogue. ADR stands for Automated Dialogue Replacement. That means never in a cartoon, but in a live action feature film, you're shooting Ben-Hur and a plane flies overhead. Well, we didn't have planes in 20 BC or whenever Ben-Hur took place. And you can no longer use that recording made on the set. You have to throw out the sound recording and reproduce what the actors say. So it is the ADR editor's job to um, bring an actor into a recording studio, play for them on a screen with headphones, and they can hear their original performance and then re-speak the line hopefully with the right intent and performance and character uh, nuance. And then it's the ADR editor takes those recordings and fits them perfectly to the mouth so the lips are opening and closing when they're supposed to. It's probably the job closest allied to track reader that I described earlier at the, in the beginning of the interview. Oh Sorry, goodness. that was a long, that was no, a long no, go. Is that too no, much? That's, <laughs> that was, oh my goodness, that was such a great explanation of it because, again, if if you're just a person that enjoys watching something or listening to it and you've never done it, it is so easy to take for granted the, <laughs> the amount of work that goes into something. Um, I now, the next time that I watch an episode of Scooby, especially, because it's it's animation, it's it's way more basic than something like a film like Dune, you know, very mm. much on, on the, the more basic scale. Mm. And yet, everything that you have described is still just as important to the mm. story and selling what the people are seeing. Mm. And it's just amazing how much work and effort and time goes into this 22 minutes that we sit and consume and we don't even think about the hundreds and thousands of, of feet of, of, you know, animation role, like the painting yeah. and the drawing yeah. all, oh my goodness. It's amazing. Like you deserve a standing ovation just for <laughs> any of these jobs. Like anyone who does this, like you guys are amazing <laughs> that for, for like all of that for just 22 minutes right. of joy. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. It's um, it, the interesting thing about all of that to me is that it's all meant to be invisible. You, you, if I'm doing my job correctly, even on a Dune or a Mad Max, I don't want the audience to be thinking that I'm the puppet master pulling their strings with sound. The best work is work that goes unnoticed in a sense. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, just uh, amazing, amazing. And sound effects are so interesting, especially if you're watching animation, like the mm. silly sounds, the fun mm. sounds and things like that. So you actually worked, uh, you're credited as a sound effects editor on what is my personal favorite second 
second favorite Scooby-Doo episode uh, of all time, The Night Ghoul of Wonderworld. It was an episode of Scooby-Doo and Scrappy. Mm -hmm. So this episode for me is filled with really fun sounds. We have a robot Sherlock Holmes Ooh. goes haywire. So there's like sizzling and buzzing <laughs> and things like that. There's a mechanical horse that falls apart and he uh, neighs, but he doesn't quite sound like a horse. He has uh -huh. that robotic kind of sound. Yeah. Uh, there's the Big Ben clock tower chiming. Like mm. it's so full of just wonderful, wonderful sounds. I love it so much. Are there certain types of effects or settings or maybe even like a theme like a western or a romance or fantasy something like that that are just more time consuming or take more effort or are more difficult to create sound for than others and have you ever been unsuccessful at creating a sound that you really wanted for a part <laughs> yes and yes <laughs> there it is um <laughs> all right the first question was um do I have a favorite genre to work in? I'm sorry, I didn't. I would I would love for you to give us your favorite as well, but specifically, oh. are there any that's more difficult? To oh, do? Um, there's two answers to that question. Um, it's animation and science fiction um, are my two favorites. Um, the reason they're my favorites are that they give me the broadest blankest palette on which to apply interesting, creative, inventive sound. You know, as I said earlier, in animation, it starts with the voice. And then you, now you see these images and you see a universe that should be making a sound we're familiar with and you're not hearing any of it. Um, that gives sound designers a, a, a unique opportunity to create sonic universes that don't exist from whole cloth, from the smallest granule of sound. You have to build up everything that you see and make a, a believable soundscape. So uh, for that reason, animation is one of the great joys, especially because in live action uh, filmmaking, the sound that's recorded on the set is often tainted in some way. It's very hard to go out on location anywhere in the world and not have a great recording of an actor polluted by an airplane flying by or a dog barking off camera. And we're, so we're always dealing with these um, uh, uh, pollutants to the purity of sound that we're all after. So for that reason, animation is a great joy and maybe one of the greatest challenges because we have to convince you consciously and subconsciously, there's a little thing going on in the back of your head it's ticking and it's telling you, I don't buy this. Something doesn't feel right and it might be sound. And so uh, along the same lines, science fiction is a great challenge because you have to create the sounds of things no one's ever seen before and present them in a way that's believable. And that's a challenge. I, I can't tell you how many times I've done science fiction and it's a lot I've done for uh, Star Trek films and uh, the Blade Runner movie and Dune and numbers of others. <clears throat> and sometimes you present your sounds to the director and, you know, hey, this is the sound of a sandworm. We've never seen one before. And the director says, that's not what it sounds like to me. <laughs> and, then, and now you're in this kind of uh, odd tete-a-tete -tete about what does a sandworm sound like? Well, you know, I heard it should sound more like this and I thought it should sound like this. And now you go off and do another iteration. You come back. No, oh, that's still not quite right. <laughs> You're constantly trying to convince people of, of, of your designs. So I, I love that process and I especially love that process because I love inventing, which is one of the reasons why I enjoy songwriting. I love the process of creating from scratch. And so that's why I get the most satisfaction from animation and science fiction, because I get to create sounds that no one's ever heard before. And who are you to tell me that's not what a sandworm sounds like? Who are you to tell me that's not what a, an ornithopter sounds like, you know? So that's really fun. Now, inversely, um, most would consider that hard work because maybe I have a very fecund imagination and I, I dream up stuff quickly. But oddly, it's harder to do reality. And the reason for that is that we all live in an acoustic reality 
24-7 our entire lives. And we have a deep familiarity with what reality should sound like. And when I receive a, a film that's reality-based or, or it's uh, current, um, it's my job to put the audience in a sonic position of, of, yeah, that's what it would sound like when I'm there. And so in some ways, maybe technically speaking, um, reality is harder to do because we all know what it should sound like. Did that answer the question or did I miss one of them? Absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. I, and to be honest, I, I don't think I would have thought that that would be the case, but it, it makes complete and total sense. You know, it, it's one thing for, you know, maybe, oh, well, I think it sounds like this and I think it sounds like this, but yeah, if we have, like we all live in reality, if we already know what certain things, what the ambience should be and all of this stuff, it does take away the creativity that you have to make something new and it, it would be more difficult to, yeah. to sell people on it, I think. Yeah. You know, one of the, the, the secrets in my craft is uh, the use of metaphor, and it's most prominent in, in animation. And that's how you sneak sound by people, when you create a metaphorical sound that represents something else. So, you know, a, a fun example is um, a, a group of people are standing around and, and a, a Fred throws a rock at them and they all fall over like bowling pins. So you, you find the visual metaphor and you, and you, you, supplant, you endorse it, you, you heighten the experience with the visual, the sonic metaphor. You don't hear bodies falling on dirt, you hear pins falling over. And so too in live action cinema, do we try to trick you in those difficult reality-based scenes by using sounds that trick you into thinking that's the sound you should be hearing by using visual metaphor. I see something that moves in a way that something else does that makes a different sound. Let's supplant that. And you, you draw the audience in that way. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's such an, it, like, it really is an art sound. I, I don't know Thanks. that, <laughs> I don't know that a, a number of years ago that I would have realized that, but it, it's so, like it's amazing. It's amazing. I think that everyone needs to to have a proper appreciation for the amazing things that you guys do. It's it's really incredible. Really Thanks. incredible. As someone uh, that know, can't do any of that and <laughs> wouldn't even try, I mean, amazing. Seriously. Anybody can learn it. I, you know, I think anyone I think art can be taught and I, that flies in the face. I think creativity can be taught because it's a muscle that you have to exercise and practice with. Right. And when you know the right muscles to exercise, you can become great at anything. And um, one of the examples I like to use is that I, to me, sound design is no different than musical composition. If you look at what I do, I deal with sound, I deal with timbres, I deal with voicings, I deal with time. If, if you looked at the score to a, a great symphony, you'd see it broken down into its component parts that sounds were being played up here and in the middle and the low sounds and some of them are very rapid and some of them are very languid. Every, all of those, I'm using all of those tools in the design of sounds and the only difference is that the sounds I use are not harmonic. Everything, all the sounds that I use are dissonant and enharmonic, as we say. But the, the, the approach to it is no less studied. Every sound that you hear in a cartoon or movie is contemplated and thoughtful and has a reason for being, and no sound is ever out of place. Just as you'd never hear a flat or a clam, as we say in music, you'd never hear a clam in, in a properly recorded composition. Yeah, yeah, it is very deliberate everything that you do you don't you don't leave anything to chance and that that is the mark of a true craftsman i think when <laughs> and it's it's wonderful it's wonderful to see people who have a passion for what they do because i feel like that passion is the one thing that i don't know that it can be taught i think it can be learned uh, uh. because you may not be passionate about something when you start but the more that you are involved in it the more you mm. grow to love it obviously you will grow passionate about uh. it but yeah. I, I really do feel like when people like you are passionate about your job or you're not just doing a job, like you legitimately 
seem like you love what you do and you enjoy it, mm. I feel like that translates in what you end up creating and putting out there. Mm. And that's, that's something that's really special. Really you special. said something right in the middle there that's really valuable about um, not leaving anything to chance. There's never a mistake. And George Lucas, the great director, producer of the Star Wars universe, um, says some, this, I'll credit it to him because these are close to his words, but that is at the beginning of a movie when the lights go down, you don't see a card that comes up and says, we didn't have enough time or money to really do the visual effects right. And some of the sounds might not be right. We just, you know, there was, and it rained that day. So it's not going to look quite right. It should have been a sunny day. You don't get to put an excuse in front of your work. That's the way art is just arrives as it is. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it. Um, so sound in some respects, it really is the key element to selling a scene properly, no matter what you're doing. If you're doing animation or you're doing a movie, regardless of genre, sound is actually very, very important. If we were watching Scooby and the gang being chased through a spooky castle by a mm. ghost mm. and it was absolutely silent, mm. it just wouldn't feel the same. You of wouldn't course. be scared. You know, the sound effects that go along with that are mm -hmm. super important to mm -hmm. how much you believe the scene, how much you can interact with the scene, like if your imagination uh, and, and how well it plays. Um, so though... Can I get an amen? Sweet, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So even though sound is so integral to every production, uh, it is often a feature that's overlooked by by all by all of us that are are not aware of what's going on behind the scenes. Mm. Um, but since sound and music are so powerful, you know they set the tone and the atmosphere of the setting with a single beat or a single note. I mean, you can mm. change the mood like that mm. instantaneously. So true. So true. Um, you can feel all kinds of emotions. You can be afraid, you can be mm. happy, joy, sorrow, terror, terror anything, yeah. just with sound, sound yeah. alone, even without a yeah. visual. Yeah. So what do you think it is about sound and music that humans react to and connect with so deeply? And how do you tap into that when you're working on creating the sounds of a production? Oh boy, that's a two hour seminar, that one. <laughs> We've got um, the time. <laughs> um, I, I have an hypothesis about sound. It's, it's a little heady, and then I'll try to answer the question directly. Sound, in a sense, is two senses. It's like the bonus sense, because sound reproduces in waves, and waves um, uh, vibrate the cilia in your inner ear, and your brain translates that into hearing but because waves are physical and transmitted through the air or water we also feel sound and I think for that reason sound is arguably a more powerful than than our, our visual faculty because we're feeling it and we're hearing it at the same time um, I have a good friend who lectures often about sound and he takes a poll and he asks the audiences if you had um, a choice between remembering a deceased loved one with a photograph or a sound recording, most people instinctually will say the sound recording because there's something visceral about that. There's something that feels more near and emotional. Um, I'm, I'm searching for adjectives, but we have a, 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 this other kinship with sound that I, I don't think we have as much with our visual faculties. So um, the, uh, I, as I said earlier, I consider myself as much a composer as anything. I may call myself a sound designer, but I use the same tools that a composer uses to manipulate an audience. And um, I mean that very directly. Uh, sound at its best is manipulating when you least know it. Um, you know, there is, there's this fancy word we use, diegetic. That, we, can, we can be very direct uh, with diegetic sound. You see something on screen, you see a lightsaber, you make the sound of a lightsaber, and that's really simple, and there's, there's probably not a whole lot of content 
in that where it's, it's working on some other level. But you, you have this, this amazing backdoor ability because it's sneaking in while the, the eyes are dominating. And, and let's touch on that biologically for a moment. Um, the, think of the brain as a computer and it's a processor. The eyes, because of the amount of nerve endings, are taking up a significantly greater amount of the processing power of your brain than the ears are. So we get to have the sort of backdoor entry into your subconscious while the eyes have you looking at something else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have this ability to, to kind of uh, lead you a little bit when you're least aware of it with sound. And that gives us all sorts of fun ways of, of moving along a, a story. You know, here's maybe a, a really simple example. You see a character approach a door and they open the door. Um, and you don't see what's on the other side of the door. And with sounds as simple as birds chirping, you've set a mood, you've set a tone. Now this isn't complex sound design, but it speaks to the power of sound and the connections we make with sound that we don't think about. Now inversely, you could open that door and not see what's on the other side of the door and you could hear sirens, please sirens. That would create a whole other kind of f emotional feel for that beat. And you don't even know where this individual is yet. This could be the first shot in a movie and immediately you're telling stories. Here's another example, of a very simple one. Character walks in, you're in a medium shot, you just see a face. And maybe they walk into a bank. Maybe you could see a teller off in the distance. And um, what you hear is keys jiggling in their pocket. What does that say to an audience? Hmm. It's not a test. It says this character is nervous because when we're nervous, at least for a man perhaps, or maybe a woman, most women don't keep their keys in their pockets, but men do. <laughs> and that would be a sonic tell that this character is nervous. You don't see the pants, you don't see the hand, I mean, it could be a purse too. Um, it's a way of stating the character's emotional state very, very efficiently without having to use what we call exposition, words. We don't have a voiceover telling you, John just walked into a bank and he wants a loan and he doesn't think he's gonna get it. I think I can say that in about a second and a half with some keys jiggling in his pocket. Sure. That's the power of sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've worked in the industry long enough. You've experienced both the age of practical effects, sound effects, uh, and also you've seen the rise of digital computer effects, uh, mm -hmm. something that I feel like is probably still evolving on a near daily basis at the mm -hmm. moment. Uh, mm -hmm. It's evolving all of the time. Um, how has the advancement in technology impacted what you do and how you do it? The technology, specifically digital recording and editing and playback, the ability to use digital audio to create has greatly enhanced my creativity as well as my efficiency. Um, in the old days, I started on this giant steam pow steampunk thing called a moviola. It was the size of a refrigerator and you put physical sound that had sprockets on the sound and you had to splice it with scissors and use glue and tape all your sounds together. And because it's physical media, it is prone to damage. And this would happen frequently to us in, in, in those days. You'd have edited a long stretch of sound on a piece of tape and it would get put in the machine the wrong way and get torn to shreds. There's two hours worth of work gone. Now, of course, I could do something on a digital workstation and my hard drive could crash, but it's far less likely to happen if you use proper digital hygiene or computer hygiene. So it's certainly made my work more um, efficient. And um, it's had a sort of a, it's a kind of a blessing and a curse though. Um, in the early days of physical media, we only had 
two or three or four tracks of sound that we'd go to our final mix with. We'd edit our dialogue and our music and our sound effects, and we'd take them to a recording studio and combine them to make the final soundtrack. And um, you couldn't hear it that way. Because it was physical media, you edited uh, linearly and singularly. You could cut one sound at a time, but you didn't know how it would sound if you wanted to sand sandwich it with another sound and make it a polyphonic sound or something a little more layered or, or interesting. So um, on the uh, negative side, you never really knew what your work sounded like until it was too late. You've taken your sounds to the mix. But once you got really good at that, what it what you developed was a sense of imagination. And the really great sound designers in, in my community started in that kind of work because they used to hear the mix in their head. They could hear the, the little timpani drum hit and the little flute whistle at the same time, even though they couldn't do it physically, they could do it imaginatively. And I think that created more effective sound designers because they were building in their head, which is kind of what recreativity is, right? We're building something that doesn't exist in our heads. But nonetheless, I'm a big believer of and sitting at a very expensive digital sound editing studio here. And I'm very grateful to have those tools because though I can hear in my head and I can build in my head, I like having 32 tracks that I can stack on top of each other and Ah, uh, that's kind of good, but if I take out this one and put in that one, that's even a better sandwich than I had before. So I'm I'm grateful for those tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While you were talking, I was thinking that I I was curious if you thought that being being able to have started in the more humble sense of sound editing and sound effects, if that gave you I I don't I don't want to say a leg up, but if it gave you something a little bit extra that you still bring to your job that someone who was just starting out in 2023 yeah. and all they know is the digital side mm -hmm. of everything. If they, if they maybe are, are going to be missing something that, that you got to experience that might make them a little bit better or more intuitive mm -hmm. or more mm -hmm. creative in mm -hmm. doing the job today. It's a really good question because it speaks to um, the value of technology and, and its, its, its downsides. I will agree with you humbly that I developed a skill that younger, more modern sound designers don't develop. They can develop if they are disciplined and if they are taught correctly. But I developed this imaginative skill that is often dismissed or not even explored in the digital realm for this reason. I knew I had to be efficient. That was enforced on me that I had to keep my work to say eight tracks. Off I go to the studio and I had to think about what are the eight most valuable sounds I really want to use. The inverse has happened now with digital technology. The, the universe is at your disposal. You have infinite sound libraries and infinite numbers of tracks. If you have 100 tracks, you're going to fill 100 tracks and never make a decision. The great sound designer and designers I know working today understand how to enforce a discipline upon themselves instead of never committing. I think to be an artist is to commit. If you're a painter, boom! Here's my painter, you can love it or you can hate it, but that's what I'm hanging on the wall. And the reason you got to that kind of painting is that you told yourself before you put brush to canvas, I'm gonna just use blues and greens because that's the feeling I want. And now you're defining a palette. This is also true of great sound designers and composers. We create a world that we wanna work within and that those restrictions actually uplift us. They don't constrain us. Yeah. That's very reminiscent of, I, I watch, I, I like to watch a lot of cooking competition shows. And a lot of times <laughs> you have these very accomplished chefs. It's not that they've made, like their dish is amazing, but whoever is judging them says, you know, this was really great, but it could have stood like a little bit of editing. Mm -hmm. You You maybe didn't need 10 ingredients you could have stopped at seven and it yeah. would have been even better even though you technically gave us more right 
it would have been better with a little bit of editing and discipline. It's the same principle. That's a great analogy. There's so many great um, cooking and sound analogies as it happens. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I like, I've I've said a few times in some lectures that um, uh, because I, I, I believe that everything in sound should be as original and, and as bespoke as possible. And we find that true in cooking as well. No self-respecting chef would put canned peas in their featured dish on the menu than I would a canned sound in my soundtrack. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) (laughs) Now there's a really great featurette, uh, guys, you can watch it on YouTube uh, from 2021 uh, called The Sound of Dune. And in this, you said this, this is a quote from you from that. We never embark on these projects knowing what the final landing place is. I think if we did, we wouldn't be artists because then it's all canned and premeditated. That's the joy and the fear of being an artist is that you go in feet first saying, I'm gonna trust this and I'm gonna just see what comes out the other side. (laughs) As an artist myself, I love that quote. I love it. (laughs) Thanks. Absolutely, completely agree. So no matter what project you're working on, you are essentially creating an entire world for Mm. other people to inhabit for this period of time that they're Mm -hmm. gonna sit down and watch what you have produced. Correct. Um, What aspect of, like there's so many, obviously, there's a lot of creativity goes into all of this, but what aspect of that creative process most drives you to do this job? Is it the challenge for you or the anticipation and the thrill of that unknown or is it even just after all is said and done and all of that work that you've put into it getting to see other people's reaction and say yes i hit it that was what i wanted you guys love it and i'm Mm. glad that you love it all of those things are true in in, in a sense self-evident um we all like we, you know, there, there's there's a child in every artist that needs approval, right? In some yes. sense, we never grow up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, and I don't know if this is cultural <clears throat> or if it's uh, nurture or if it's nature, but I, I'm Italian. I'm 100% Italian. My relatives all came from Italy. <clears throat> and there's a Geppetto in me, the, the Geppetto who made Pinocchio. And if you remember anything about Geppetto, it's that he did it for himself and no one else. And I'm happy to create a beautiful thing, which is a complete and perfect little jewel of a soundtrack. And I can put it up on a shelf and even if no one ever sees it, but of course I want everyone to see it and enjoy it. I I take a deep pride in, in accomplishment through um, the overcoming of obstacles, um, the the unique knowledge that I created something that didn't exist before, that that I was the author of something new and unique, and I there's this sort of Italian craftsman in me that has to express constantly, and that's why I've done 155 movies. I keep going because I love the process of creation and challenging myself and seeing where I go with it. And uh, fully acknowledging that it's terrifying almost every minute of the journey. Because especially at the beginning of a project, uh, it's uh, my wife could tell you, I always say to her, oh my God, I just looked at the movie, it's day one. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. And I, am, I have massive anxiety creative anxiety because I don't know. and But I do know enough to know that it is in the process of jumping in feet first and trying and experimenting and succeeding and failing and then succeeding again that I end up where I've ended up. It's harder to have that confidence when you're young because you haven't proven it to yourself yet. But every time I say it to my wife, she says, you said this on Mad Max, you said this on Star Trek. like." Go on, you're going to be fine. (laughs) That's kind of funny. Before we actually started this interview, I was so nervous. And my husband was like, you're just talking to another human being. It's okay. And yeah, and I know that, but still. (laughs) 
yeah, we have these crazy fears. It's uh, like imposter syndrome. It's it's so many stupid things that we should forget about. <laughs> if only it was that easy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It never goes away. I, you'd think I've been doing this 47 years and I still get butterflies before I go on stage. Man. So you started out at Hanna-Barbera working on cartoons and you've worked on animated projects through the years. You've worked on movies like Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, Poltergeist, Gremlins, The Green Mile, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem, and mm. Dune and Mad Max Fury Road, both of which you won Oscars for. Mm. And like you said, a uh, hundred some other titles <laughs> that you've worked on. You got to be a sound designer on Metallica through the Never and write and perform music for several movies. Can you explain the differences between doing the sound for an animated series versus a movie versus a musician or soundtrack? And how did you go from cartoons to movies? Oh, boy, that's a lot of questions. <laughs> um, well, I think the difference between what I do daily, which is sound design, the difference between that and the writing the score for a film, I think, is pretty obvious. There's the composer is um, charged with telling story with music using sound that the audience relates to as music, and arguably the the composer has a palette that that. Um, 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 supports their ability to lead the audience more emotionally. I can do some of that lifting with sound, but I don't think I can get quite as deep as a composer when they want to get you to cry when the, the boy and the girl break up. Um, so I think those, those delineations are pretty clear, yeah? I mean, the composer or the music editor, their job is to make sure the music is communicating the story and my job is to make sure that all the other things we hear, dialogue, sound effects, Foley, ADR, they're communicating the story in the most effective way to lead the audience uh, to, um, and help the director. Because ultimately, we both, the composer and I, both work for the director. Our job is to please them first while doing what's right by the movie. And for many, that's a crucial footnote to remember because it's really hard to design or compose and then watch your your work um, not be used and it happens to composers and sound designers all the time you write an emotional cue for the love theme the love scene <clears throat> and the director says you know what these performances are so strong we don't need music there and you feel crushed as a composer you know, I've, I've built entire space battles and had the, co the director say, you know what, um, the work you did is amazing. I love the sounds of the spaceships and the, the lasers, but this should feel more operatic. I'm just going to use music and no dialogue and no sound. And you have to be ready to dispassionately let go of all the, the emotional attachment you have to the work, as well as the memory of the nights and weekends you spent making it, all the effort you put into something, and you have to, in a heartbeat, be willing to say, yeah, that's what works for this movie. It's an essential um, characteristic, I think, for, for artists in our field, anyway. Um, so that's part of your question. There was, what was the last part of the question? I didn't answer it. How did you go from cartoons to movies? Oh, um, that's good. Uh, I was happy as a clam at Hanna-Barbera. I was getting paid more money than I had ever seen in my life, which was a whopping $200 a week. But in 1976, for me, that was a lot. of. I had only been like a stock boy at a department store <laughs> making $2 an hour. So I was working on cartoons that I loved, and I was working in Hollywood, California, surrounded by crazy, goofy people that made silly sounds for a living where farting was acceptable. And I felt like I had just found it. I had just landed, and I was, I was happy as could be <clears throat> until 19... 77 and I saw Star Wars and then I made this little light bulb went off I, I've never I've never been an individual with huge like career aspirations. I don't I never thought big 
Um, I just felt like if I'm making enough money and I love what I do, that's a pretty complete life. But then I saw Star Wars and the light bulb went off. I thought, wait a minute, that sound was amazing. I do sound. Maybe I could do something like that. That would be way more satisfying than every week putting in the same old bowling pin sounds and frying pan hits. Um, I want to make a mark, no pun intended, with my sound work, and I want to be recognized for my creativity. And that's when I realized I got to leave. And as fate would have it, my mentor, Bill Kowalchuk at Hanna-Barbera, a lovely man who would stay after work and teach me how to create sounds and edit sounds and he'd give me a project and I'd stay late at night after everybody had closed the doors and the next morning he'd come in and I'd play in my work and he'd guide me as a mentor should and that same time that I had this epiphany he moved to Paramount Studios he was tired of cartoons as well and he got a job in their sound department at Paramount and I called him up and I said, Bill, get me out of here. <laughs> he got me an interview with Howard Beals, the head of the department, who took a liking to me. And I had a job offer as an apprentice. It was a step down. I would have to apprentice all over again with the, the, the sound editors at Paramount. But I was happy to make that move so that I could advance my career. Move to Paramount apprenticed with a lovely man named Sean Hanley who was working on the first Star Trek movie. And again, fate would intervene with me, um, directed by the great Robert Wise, one of the great directors of all time. And sadly, Sean would get very ill and have to leave the film. And when he was asked by Robert Wise who should take over the project, instead of recommending the 10 old white-haired guys, males, in the department who had seniority said, take the kid. <laughs> and that's when I met Robert Wise. I got to work on a Star Trek movie. It's like, what? This is crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, I would meet my two future business partners that I would then start a studio with for 25 years. Wow. Yeah, that's right. amazing. That's, that's nutty. Amazing. That's nutty. <laughs> I've seen a few the clips here and there over the years where you get to see how some practical sound effects are made you know behind the scenes like what are you you're banging on something or like you say <laughs> somebody's running across the floor yeah um and i think that's just fascinating that you can think of the sound that you need going a little more creative than just a running thing but you, yeah. you can think of something and then now you have to make it you have to find some way to make that sound a reality sure. from what's in your head yeah. So I would love to know what is the craziest or most creative practical sound effect that you've done and how did you make it? I, I, I hate to say, it, but there's, that's what I do every day. Um, I, I can't pick a craziest, but I'll, I'll tell you one that's maybe relatable because you could probably go see it or hear it right away. In Dune, um, there's a beat where the sandworm breaches and there's this spice harvester right on the top of the sand and the the sandworm sucks this gigantic you know harvester into its maw and it recedes into the the the, the subterranean desert and what you see on screen is this the sand starts to fold in and then you see this big open mouth underneath the desert and it sucks the thing and i i was thinking I, I, there are no sound worms, so I can't record them. Um, uh, so how am I going to challenge, how am I going to channel this? And I realized the answer was by using my own voice. It needed to be organic. It needed to sound primal. Um, and often the best way to do something is to do it yourself. So I took a lavalier mic, it wasn't this one, but it was one very much like this. And I put it down, down my throat. I won't do it now. And I went, <laughs> and I, so I took that sound, which even like that is fairly powerful. And I manipulated it by slowing it down and lowering the pitch to give it a vast size and depth. And I added some subwoofer so that it would rattle the theater. 
And that's what that sound was. And all, very often, the, what are seemingly the most complex sounds, or the most difficult to achieve, can be can can be achieved in in very very simple ways. And be, and I use my voice for a lot of things, uh, inanimate things. I mean, not just vocal yeah. things. Um, in in Dune, um, Frank Herbert talks very poetically about the spice. And it's infused in the sand all over Arrakis, and it has this crystalline structure that crunches underfoot. And we wanted all of the walking sounds, the foley, as we say, to have that feel of spice underfoot. And we tried sugar and crystalline things, but the secret would end up being Rice Krispies. So we went out to the Mojave Desert to record all our sand sounds, and we brought truckloads of Rice Krispies, bar you know, poured miles of Rice Krispies into the sand, and re-performed those movements of Paul Atreides walking across this desert on top of Rice Krispies mixed in with desert sand. <laughs> That's amazing. That's but you know, amazing. we're we're thinking of that that sort of metaphorical thinking. It's like I knew Rice Krispies crunched, crackled. You know, we've heard the commercials a thousand times, and now we're back to animation. Yeah, <laughs> it's oh not crackling God. pop. <laughs> it sounds like a fun job. I mean, I sit at a desk yeah. all day. I don't ever get to do anything fun like that. <laughs> That's one of the joys for me is that, um, in some sense, it's a desk job. I sit at a most of the time, a computer terminal editing sound on a digital workstation. So I have monitors here and I have computers and trackballs and mixing consoles. And that's, you know, half of my day. But the other half is getting out into the field, going to San Diego to take a trip on, a, on an aircraft carrier because I have to record F-18s or going out to the desert to record worms burying in the sand or going to an animal park in uh, Northern California to record marmosets because I need weird creature sounds. That's really some of the, the funnest stuff is getting out and uh, capturing sound like, oh, how am I going to use that? <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Your son, Rio, is an actor, musician, and composer. I think it's really cool that he's followed in your footsteps and I'm just wondering how did he get into the business and did your other kids get into the business at all? Um, my two older boys uh, are not in the business. Um, one is a UX designer for Herbalife and the other sells high-end audio gear but didn't want to get into entertainment. Um, Rio Route, Rio's route was, was interesting because he started life as a very gifted pianist. Um, back to our very early story, discussion, Wendy, um, we, he won, we went to a preschool or grade school silent auction, and my wife and I bid on piano lessons, and we got it for like $25, a Yamaha, you know, buy the book, piano lessons and we put him in this class. We bid on lots of other stuff too. There were fencing lessons and all sorts of other things, but we knew as parents that um, the value of musical training on the nascent growth of the brain and how important that is. So we thought, and we had actually tried to get him, I'm a guitarist, so I tried to teach him guitar. No, nah, I don't like guitar. Tried violin, no, nah, I don't like violin. Finally it came to piano and we thought, okay, we're gonna, kind of insists that he at least follow through on the lessons and then you can let it go. And within four or five weeks, he was playing very advanced compositions that we were unaware of. And one day the teacher called us privately. It was a public class with 30 kids. And she said, there's something going on with your son. And we had a discussion and she said, he's got to get out of this class. He needs private lessons. We hired a, a, a classically trained uh, Russian pianist from the conservatory, and she would become his, his teacher for about five or six years. And the progress that he made was extraordinary. He has, he has, he has, a, um, he has perfect pitch. Um, he has this extraordinary ear, and we would, he would win several piano competitions locally, as well as going to New York and playing at Carnegie Hall in competitions. And he just developed a love for music and we just loved that. <clears throat> and as that developed, he, he loves movies. He developed 
a, a singular passion for film going. Um, and I, I, you know, we love movies too, but I don't go to half the movies he goes to. This is something he wants to do. And he made a simple connection, I presume, of, hey, I'm a musician, I love what I hear, um, I, I think composition is, is something I want to pursue. So he began studying the great cinema composers and imitating them. And that would turn into getting into high school and his friends. We live in a Hollywood community, so all of his friends are erstwhile directors, writers, cinematographers, actors. And um, he was the go-to because his dad was in sound for sc scoring all of their student projects, thus developed his, his film scoring skills. That's great. Have you worked on any projects with him? <laughs> you won. This <laughs> <laughs> is the best story because he wrote a cue for his second film that required an acoustic guitar. He's a keyboard player. And he said, Dad, I want you to play on this. Here's the melody. Learn it. We're going to record it tomorrow. And it was brutal. He, he, he's, he's, got, he's so much better a musician than I am. And he tortured me for 37 takes. It was only like a two-minute song. <laughs> no, Dad, it's a D sharp. That's not a D. That's a D sharp. And we're in 5-4 time. Stop counting it as in fours. And he tortured I would end up getting it, but... Uh, he never reused me again, and he's since <laughs> taught himself to play guitar and bass. And now he does his own <laughs> guitar stuff. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's great. <laughs> yeah, but he's amazing. He's an amazing kid. The, the creativity just drips off of him. I, I wish I had half of his creativity. That's awesome. I, I love to hear that. I love that he followed in your footsteps, and yeah, that's just so great. We're hoping someday we will hit the trifecta and he will act. He's a very accomplished actor. He's, in fact, he starts shooting a movie next week. Um, I want him to act in a movie, score it, and I'll do the sound design and I'll mix it. <laughs> that would be awesome, yeah. Well, I hope that happens. I hope for you guys that that is. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any fun stories that you can share from your career in the industry? I did hear from somebody that you have a Frank Welker story. I have so many Frank Welker stories. I'm trying to remember. I, I, I almost killed him on Gremlins. <laughs> Frank has been a, a dear friend since Hanna-Barbera. I just, whenever his tapes came down, I, I, he'd make me laugh. And, and he would actually save my butt on Raiders of the Lost Ark um, during the Hanna-Barbera years tapes come down from the studio and the actors are always goofing around between takes and Frank used to like to practice his voices one of which included an imitation of a monkey and cut to I've, I'm, I've left Hanna-Barbera and I've left Paramount and I'm working independently and I'm working on Raiders of the Lost Ark and my one of my areas of responsibility was the scene with Sulla and the, the trained monkey and the Nazis try to find Marion in the basket. And we, you know, none of that had sound. It was all very bad production sound. And even what there was was noisy because it was modern Cairo, not 1942 Cairo. So I knew I had to create a voice for the monkey. And the first thing I did was I went to some animal farms and some zoos to record and capture actual simians. And I would be almost almost deathly um, attacked by a macaque um, at a particular farm. And then I pieced all those sounds together and it's just, it didn't have the whimsy that I wanted. And then, you know, one morning in the shower, ding, Frank! Frank used to do that funny monkey. And we called him in and it was just genius to watch him perform. And you can look it up online on my webs or on my youtube channel you can find frank's first performance of the scene where the monkey tries to poison indiana jones with the the bad date and that's frank doing all three characters voices and the monkey voice in real time and had us in stitches that day it was it was so memorable 
But the other, the, uh, the other, one of the other stories is that for gremlins, I knew I wanted Frank for the character of Stripe, the mean gremlin who dies in the end of the film because he's exposed to water and he kind of melts away. And we queued up that scene and Frank did his best kind of gurgly, gargly death throes. And I, I pushed him too hard and I said, Frank, um, I, I just need it to sound like there's just all sorts of phlegm in your voice. So why don't you try this? I'm going to pour some water in your mouth while you do the take. And so he does this and the microphone's up here and I pour a cup of water and he almost um, drowns because it goes down his windpipe and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it was horrible. And I don't think he talked to me for a while after that particular recording. <laughs> he was always skeptical whenever I called him after that. <laughs> But what a what a genius he was and still is. Yeah. He's an amazing man, and uh, he I think he's our generation's Mel Blanc. He's done so many voices, Absolutely. including for Scooby Doo. Was he? He wasn't Fred. Which? Yeah, he's he? Fred. He is. He Fred. still oh. voices Fred too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. He's a great guy. Is there a specific story that I, you'd heard that I haven't told? It was the one about you almost killing Frank. I didn't hear the story, just that you almost killed him. <laughs> Did he tell you that? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> he's still steaming about it. He took my call a couple of weeks ago, so I think he's over it that's now. Good. That's good. 40 years later. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, thank you for sharing those with us. That's, that's yeah. great. <laughs> Yeah, I should, probably should have remembered. I mean, gosh, there's so many crazy stories of recording. Uh, you know, I've the, the animal records are always challenging because I've gotten in cages with elephants and, and big cats and dangerous animals and almost been trampled and attacked and bitten and those kinds of things. Those, those are always kind of spooky. And, and I'm always in high velocity, high speed, sports cars, I'm always recording, you know, Lamborghinis and Ferraris for these kind of chase movies. I go out a lot with the military, the Navy and the Army um, to record munitions and bombs. And that's always fun playing around with things that go boom. <laughs> uh, you don't think right. about the sound being Da a dangerous job, but it does sound like you've put yourself in some dangerous situations. Like anything, with risk, there's reward. And the closer you get to something, the often the better it sounds. The more risk you take to get exactly the sound that you want, the more you push the envelope to get what you hear in your head, the more likely it is that it's becoming more and more dangerous to get it in the first place. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think if I where I've the closest I've ever come. You know, <laughs> on Dune, where <clears throat> I've done a lot of dangerous things. Um, <clears throat> on Dune, I wanted the sound of the bodies rolling down the sand dunes, and sometimes the best way to do something is to do it yourself, and that was very painful. We went to Mo the Mojave Desert and climbed two and three thousand foot sand dunes, and I was the one that volunteered to do the rolling, and I tossed myself <clears throat> down the, the dune face and rolled 3,000 feet and would hit my head on a rock. I, I, didn't get, I didn't get a concussion or anything, but it was very painful. And I would go home with bruises all over my body. And of course, just being out in the desert, <clears throat> it's you know 90 degrees. We schlepped you know, tons and tons of water, but we're out in the noonday sun for nine hours trying to capture authentic sounds in the desert. When I, um, you may have heard or seen some of these National Geographic specials about the singing dunes. Um, dunes themselves with the right composition of sand and the right humidity um, make this lovely moaning sound when the wind pushes a mass of sand in, in, in one direction. And you get this very pure musical sound. And you can look this up on YouTube. They're easy to find. And I was determined to get that. And I was in uh, Doha, Qatar uh, for a film festival. And they offered to take me out to their dunes. 
So I wanted to record those sounds and their dunes, but the only way to do it is to trigger a landslide <clears throat> because if there's no wind, nothing is moving the sand. So they brought two Toyota Land Cruisers up to the top of the dune and we got in them and we're pointed down 45 degrees <clears throat> and we triggered massive landslides that I just nearly escaped getting caught in, but I got amazing recordings <laughs> of these singing sand dunes. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> I think you're just as adventurous as some of the characters in the movies that you <laughs> that you've worked on. <laughs> I'll do anything to get a good sound. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my, my wife is a constant target. Um, if, you know, often mm -hmm. to get a sound, you need somebody to record it and somebody to perform it, and she's very often the performer because I have to hold the microphone and do all that kind of stuff and. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's participated and you know she will very often wake up in the middle of the night it's two in the morning and there's a thunderstorm and I'm in my underwear with a microphone out the window <laughs> having jumped out of bed because I keep a recorder by my bedside just like Keith Richards kept a little cassette deck next to his bedside and record when he wrote satisfaction so she she's woken up many a morning early to find me monkeying around with something we have we live in the hills of, of of sherman oaks which is near hollywood and we abut to a hillside where there's a community of coyotes and if that pack often will go on a hunt and catch a rabbit and they go into hysterics for five minutes and i love recording those yeah it's great <laughs> Is there anything in your career, like you've done so many things, you've, you've dabbled in all of it. Is there anything that you haven't gotten to do yet that you'd still really like to do? I haven't done a Western yet. Um, I've done everything but a Western, I think. And that's, you know, Westerns are so uniquely sonically interesting with horses and the quiet of the desert and tumbleweed and and revolvers and, and shootouts, you know, in, on, on Main Street and the saloon and the swinging doors and the, they're just so, such a rich palette and I haven't had an opportunity to do that. Do you know anybody? Oh, I, I wish if I did, I'd be like, Hey, here, Mark, Mark's here. Mark's here. Come do it right now. Get it yeah. done. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I just had the good fortune to start work. I, I went 45 years without doing a documentary and now I've done three in the last three years. So that, that's been a joy too. Those are, you know, documentaries are a very, very different beast in the way you present sound. There's, a, there's integrity and honesty to what you're doing because you don't want to deceive the audience. You, you're arguably trying to present the reality that was actually there at the time the, the, the image was captured. Mm -hmm. That's a unique responsibility. and. Documentary filmmakers are just a, filmmakers are just a different beast. Um, they're, 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 there's a passion that's very different from narrative cinema um, filmmakers, and I love that. And you know, unfortunately, documentaries don't have the budgets that narrative films do, but the joy in them is worth it to me. And I'll often take a hit on my salary. Because I, 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 if it's if it's content that I'm really engaged in, then I really like. I did a film last year for Amazon called Goodnight Oppie, and it's a beautiful movie about the Mars rover Opportunity that went to Mars 18 years ago, was supposed to last six months, and last 15 years, and sent back troves of scientific data, and it was a gorgeous movie about science the joy of science and the community that surrounds NASA and JPL and the love for this little robot that they, they invested in like a child. And that was the story. So that was really fun to do. Just go see it, really, I promise you, you'll love it. <laughs> Good night, Oppie. <laughs> I don't know, if you have any other stories you wanna share, we've taken up a lot of your time, so. I don't, I don't want to keep you too long, but you, this has been amazing. Like, oh, yeah, it's been really wonderful to talk to you. It's yeah. very informative oh, and interesting and it's just great. We, you both have, have, have done the research on me and my work. So it's, it's just a pleasure to respond to much more probing questions. 
I really appreciate the the hard work you both have put in to to do the research. So thank you for that. Thank you. That well, you've done such great work that it was just yeah. a pleasure to learn more about you and and part of why part of why we want to do this is so that people that maybe are in the background, you know, we've talked to animators from the old days, voice actors, even people that you wouldn't necessarily, you know, walk down the street and like, oh, there's Ryan Gosling and there's an actor, you know, you, you know, their face, but so much, I mean, actors are wonderful, but the actors wouldn't be what they are. They couldn't do what they do if you guys weren't behind the scenes creating that world for them to do their thing in. And it's just a shame how I feel like the people that actually maybe put in the most work are the least recognized by us <laughs> regular people. And that's a, that's a shame. And you guys deserve recognition from like I, you, you have Oscars and that's wonderful. And I'm sure that you love them, but we just mm -hmm. want you to know too, that even us, these millions of people across the world who watch what you do, we love it. You entertain us, you give us an escape from reality, <laughs> you inspire us with your creativity. That, that is a really, that's a really big thing Thanks. to us. And you guys deserve all the love that we can give you for that. <laughs> and maybe, maybe not everybody gets recognized on the street, but hey, we mm. see you. And we love you for what you've done, and we can't wait to see what else you're gonna do. Yeah. There's some good things coming up. Can't tell you. Good. <laughs> and I do hope you get to work with your son again, because that'll be cool. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, that will happen. He's he's the best. Oh, I have one other question, and it's oh. kind of a weird question. And I have a visual. In this picture is like my favorite picture that has ever been taken of anyone and i don't i don't know if it like it's just very powerful and i'm just wondering like when was it taken and was it just like during a photo shoot what was it taken for it was taken as it was a, a gift um it's it was taken by a very famous photographer a very well-known and very accomplished photographer here in Los Angeles. And he did an amazing short film, oh, not so short, hour long film on art. And he interviewed all, like Neil Ga from Neil Gaiman to me, um, interviewed great artists and what drives them. And he had seen some of my YouTube videos and lectures and he thought everything he was covering was visual and he wanted somebody to talk about the sonic arts and i gave him a great interview so he said and um in uh, return he offered to do a headshot for me so this was a headshot done in his studio it's it's one of just two or three frames that he shot it happened really quickly but he had a very clear idea and then a very unusual like bilateral lighting setup because you can see I'm lit from both sides, but he had he had done some weird kind of um, barn doors on some of the key lights so that you got the a cat eye effect in my irises, which I think that's what kind of grabs people's like something's different about that photograph. So that was taken five years ago. Um, and in fact, you can see part of my, I'm gonna, if you go to my YouTube channel, it's called Temple of Art. If you actually just Google Temple of Art, um, oh, Alan Amato, that's the name of the photographer, an extraordinary artist in his own right and filmmaker, documentary filmmaker. Um, and he did this film called Temple of Art that I encourage you to watch. I have a little snippet of it on my YouTube channel. Excellent, Definitely. for sure, we'll check it out. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, my wife has been bugging me that that's already five years old, so I need a new one. <laughs> I, I don't know if I go back to Alan or I just tell him to know, do the same thing, but now I have less hair. <laughs> well, it's a great picture. Like, it's there's just something so like powerful with that picture. I just 
It's just you know, like, it's funny. It's 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 funny you say that because I loved it too, and the reason I loved it <clears throat> is that every picture of an individual in my community is a guy, a white-haired male, sitting at a mixing console, has a microphone in their hands, at an editing workstation. And I hate that. I don't want to be defined by my equipment. And I hate those kind of posed photographs like you're doing something. So I just told him I just want a headshot. Do not come to my studio. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's what makes great. me happy. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do what all my peers do. <laughs> he did a really good job with it. So Yeah, I'll tell him. He's a good dude. Look him up. Yeah, absolutely. It, well, the movie itself, The Temple of Art, is a very inspiring film, actually, mm -hmm. on the creative process. Yeah. It sounds very interesting. That is all the questions that we have. Thank you so much for talking to us. This was awesome. It was so great to learn all about the sound. It's really, I mean, for music being part of my life, for most of my life, the process of how all of this is done is something that I've really never mm. gotten to know. So it was really cool to learn about it. And I think that's why they call it behind the scenes, right? Maybe you <laughs> yeah. weren't supposed to. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, thank you for giving us so much of your time. We really, really appreciate it. And we really hope that you have enjoyed this. No, it has been great we fun. We, we spent almost two hours. So this has been great. <laughs> it's, it's, it's been really fun to reminisce and for you to give me the luxury and the opportunity to say what I want to say and, and just kind of speak my mind. So that's really a treat. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you, Wendy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for tuning in to another Scooby panel. I'm Nikki Blake from ScoobyAddicts.com. If you like these panels, please subscribe to my channel for more great discussions. A huge shout out to our patrons, Julie Rosen, Ross from ScoobyFan.net, Scooby-Doo of Roblox, and Tage. If you would like to support the Scooby panel, please go to Patreon.com slash ScoobyAddicts. A very special thank you to Oscar-winning sound designer Mark Mangini, and artist, blogger, and Scooby collector, Wendy Bridge. Scooby Panel is available in podcast form on most podcast platforms or as a web series on YouTube. You can find Scooby Panel on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter as at Scooby Panel. Scooby and Shaggy were voiced by Scott Innes. Check out Scott's website, onescottshop.com. Scooby Addicts artwork by Will Davenport. Video editing by Nikki Blake. Music composed and performed by Bovine Nightmares. Please join us next time for another Scooby panel.